Today we're joined by a very special guest, Dr. Paul Nelson. He's a senior research fellow uh, at the Discovery Institute. His research interests include the relationship between developmental biology and our knowledge of the history of life, the theory of intelligent design, and the interaction of science and theology. Dr. Nelson has published in journals such as Biology and Philosophy, Zygon, Rhetoric and Public Affairs, and Biocomplexity, as well as a variety of other books. He is also a contributor to the new movie Origin, which is from Illustra Media. Dr. Nelson, welcome. Thanks for having me. So I mentioned that uh, you're a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. Could you summarize for us briefly how you got involved with the Discovery Institute and what exactly their, their mission is? I've been a fellow at Discovery since 1996. I actually started there when I was still a graduate student at the University of Chicago. So a baby born that year could legally buy a martini today. Uh, 21 years is a long time, but I love my role there. And I think you could say I'm sort of a professional troublemaker. Um, I lecture all around the United States and internationally on the interface between science and philosophy and also science and theology. And at those points, there are all kinds of interesting questions that come up. So I do a variety of things. I write, I speak, I consult, uh, work on media projects, and uh, I've never regretted becoming a fellow there. It's really fun. All right. Speaking of media projects, uh, right now you're out promoting the new film Origin, uh, like I mentioned from Illustra Media. We actually have a brief clip here. Why is there life? Where did it come from? How did it come to be? When you come to the origin of life, what you're not allowed to use, fundamentally by the rules, so-called rules of science, is mind or intelligence. The only acceptable explanation has to be rendered in terms of matter and energy. The problem is that the laws of nature, as we understand them right now, seem to preclude the spontaneous origin of life. The molecules involved in life, they have no intelligence, they have no foresight, they have no way of knowing what they need to do next in order to get themselves assembled into organic chemistry. So your challenge is to go from a world governed by chemistry and physics where the living state doesn't exist, bring it into existence, and then maintain it through time so we can get to here, where we are today. That's an awful lot to account for by random chance. All right. So our audio audience obviously can't see that, but it looks like it's very well produced, a lot of cutting edge CG. It's it's pretty sharp looking. Uh, could you tell us briefly what the goal is of, of this video? Um, obviously, it's about the origin of life, presumably. Right. We're trying in the film to get people to think about the origin of life in a new way. Um, if you watch a PBS special on the question or read a popular science book or even a technical science book, uh, the story you'll get is... This puzzle, namely how did cells first come to be, can only really be solved with the tools of physics and chemistry. Um, and as I said in the clip, what you're not allowed to use is the notion of intelligence, even though in our daily lives we couldn't negotiate our day if we didn't refer to some things being caused by minds or by intelligence. So what we do in the film, uh, which comes from Illustra Media, I've worked with them for 20 years, is say, Look, here's the evidence. This is what living things present us with. Even the simplest cell that we know uh, is, is, is a universe of remarkable complexity. In light of the evidence, what's reasonable to infer about how this came to be? So we talk about information storage and transfer, metabolism, reproduction, those features of living things that, they, that all living things share, and simply put the question to the audience, in light of this, what do you think happened? if you allow yourself to consider the possibility of design. On the subject of design, in, in your estimation, um, I mean, you've been doing this for a pretty long time. Over the years, what would you say have been the two strongest examples from biology that lead to the inference of intelligent design? Well, the first one I just mentioned, which is that inside any cell is something that Darwin couldn't have known, namely uh, molecular machines processing information in fact, I'll be talking about this uh, here at Texas A&M, that, that cells, you know, from the simplest cell that we know, a bacterial cell, all the way up to the cells that constitute our body or the body of a blue whale, there are shared features 
that need to be jointly present for any kind of life at all. And those features look as if they would never arise from their chemical constituents on an early Earth. So that's the first piece. The second piece is something very dear to me, and that is developmental biology. Um, I fell in love with development as an undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh studying biology and watching a even a, a small worm like C. elegans go from a single cell to the adult, which is just a thousand cells in the adult worm, uh, is, is something that's really miraculous. Uh, so developmental biology, I think, is a little bit harder to learn because there are more details. But if I had to put on a postcard what persuades me scientifically of design, it would be single cells and their complexity and watching any animal develop. Okay. Now, also along the line of studying intelligent design for a long time, I'm sure you've encountered a couple of bad examples of intelligent design. Yes, I, I was very struck when I saw this question because yeah. there are episodes in the history of science where design was misapplied. I'll give mm. you one very striking case. Johannes Kepler, a great astronomer who gave us the laws of planetary motion on which Newton then built to give us the laws of celestial mechanics, Kepler uh, looked at the moon and he said, I can prove to you that the moon is inhabited, right? There are intelligent beings up there. And here's how he reasoned. He said, look, there are circular structures there on the surface of the moon that you can see with your naked eye. Certainly you can see them even better with a telescope. And he went on, those kinds of structures can only be produced by an architectural mind. Uh, they do not come from, as he put it, the, the movement of the elements or the laws of, of matter. Uh, so he said, look, there, there are people up there. Now, the moon is a great place. You know, it's nice for romantic songs and lights up the night. It's kind of boring. <laughs> There's definitely nobody up there. <laughs> okay. So what went wrong? What went wrong is that at his first sort of analytical node, if you think of it in terms of going through a filter of decisions, he didn't do his homework. If I took Kepler and you out to a very still pond here on the on the uh, A&M campus and we lofted a small rock in, from the point of impact, we'd have a beautiful circular array of waves radiating out or soft mud, right? Heavy rainstorm here. We go out, we find a mud patch, loft in a pebble. We're going to get a beautiful little circular crater. The laws of physics, plus how materials behave, are jointly perfectly adequate to explain why there are circles on the surface of the moon. So there are unhappy episodes in the history of science where the, the notion of intelligence has been misapplied. Usually what happens is the investigator in question has failed to do his homework. Okay. That makes that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. And what, what it shows you, actually, is that des design is testable. You mm -hmm. can posit design for some particular puzzle, and turns out you make a mistake. <laughs> yeah. It's tested, and it turns out not to work. This evening, you'll be talking on the origin of life, the Humpty Dumpty effect, and God. Uh, I know what two out of those three terms <laughs> mean. What, what exactly is the Humpty Dumpty effect? You're all familiar with the nursery rhyme, right? Mm -hmm. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him together again. You've got a, I guess you could call it an asymmetrical pathway, right, where the arrow of causality points in one direction. Once Humpty is broken, thinking it now as a regular chicken egg, you're never going to get, get Humpty back again. You can crack any number of eggs, and you will never be able to restore them to, to their original state. So it's an, it's an arrow going through time with one direction. Now, when we come to the origin of life, it's possible to take a bacterial cell in a sterile buffer and you hit it with sound waves. It's called sterilization by sonication. What happens is the sound waves disrupt the cell membrane. The contents begin to leak out into the surrounding sterile buffer. Even though at that moment, whole ribosomes, complete circular chromosome, all the ATP, all the hundreds of thousands, really, of enzymes that are present in the bacterial cell, all that hardware is there, that will never, ever return to the living state. Humpty Dumpty is not going to come back together. The puzzle for the origin of life research field is they're trying to build ribosomes. They're trying to build long strings of, of DNA. They're trying to get the bits and pieces together, hoping to bootstrap 
that into the living state, find the recipe, right, and you can get a cell. So the Humpty Dumpty effect simply says, look, you can start with all the hardware. Just, you know, disrupt the membrane. All the hardware is there, yet you will never return to the living state. Now, that effect is real. And in fact, you could do the experiment. Everyone knows what the result will be. Hydrolysis will begin to destroy. The ATP will be gone instantly, right? But hydrolysis will begin to destroy everything else that's there, the proteins and the nucleic acid. So the question is not, what's the effect? It's, what does the effect tell us? What does the effect mean? So this is a weird case where in science, you know what the experiment's going to tell you. What does it mean? And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. Um, and I think it's fascinating uh, because it's a case where philosophy, the philosophy of science, intersects with experimental biology. That, that actually sounds very fascinating, and I, and I look forward to, to hearing about it more tonight. Now I want to take a turn to a little bit of controversy. Like you said, you're a professional troublemaker. <laughs> Uh, so there are two quotes of yours that are somewhat infamous, um, and I'd just like to go over them, and maybe you can provide a little bit more more explanation behind it. Sure. So the first one is, uh, quote, easily the biggest challenge facing the intelligent design community is to develop a full-fledged theory of biological design. We don't have such a theory right now, and that's a real problem. Without a theory, it's very hard to know where to direct your research focus. Right now, we've got a bag of powerful intuitions and a handful of notions, such as irreducible complexity, but as yet, no general theory of biological design. Now, some people might say, if you don't have a theory, then it doesn't seem like intelligent design is really a scientific position. Is, is, would that be correct? Or Well, um, think about it this way. When Darwin formulated the theory of evolution in 1859, um, in the book, The Origin, there are actually no examples of natural selection. The only examples of natural selection he provides are a couple of thought experiments. So what he's saying in that book is, here's this idea that I think might have some legs, right? There might be some potential here. I don't have any actual evidence of it yet, but if you read my book and think about it, you'll begin to see I'm making a case for this, and this is something to look into. 1859, it wasn't until the 1930s so what is that, 80 years roughly, mm -hmm. that science, biology, had a mathematically precise articulated theory of evolution. So what was going on in those 80 years? What was going on is the theory had to be born. The theory had to develop. Theories, unfortunately, do not drop from trees like apples. You've got to build them. And this is, this is the case not just in biology, but in all kinds of sciences. Uh, uh, the process to having a well-developed theory takes time and a lot of hard work. So I'm not ashamed to say that I said that quote in 2004. It's probably not as accurate today. I think there's more in the way of a theory or more, you know, something more formal is beginning to develop. But if someone asks me, give me the theory of evolution, I can drop an 800-page textbook in their hands. It's it's had 150 years to develop. It's been very well articulated in tremendous detail. Um, intelligent design is not in that position yet. I still think it's scientific in the sense of providing insights into nature, but the hard work of building a testable theory is still largely before us. It just takes a long time. Um, and yeah, that, that quote from me has a, achieved some notoriety. Uh, uh, some of my friends in the intelligent design community don't like it, but it happens to be true. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and, and we, we really appreciate, you know, intellectual honesty. And I, and I was actually surprised when I came across this that, that um, a fellow who is uh, almost a, a poster child, if you will, for the Discovery Institute would say something like that. Yeah, I, know when yeah. It showed, I knew when it showed up in the New York Times and a New York Times op-ed that maybe I had said a little more than I should have. <laughs> but I, I like... I liked it as an undergraduate when my professors were straight with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that I owe that as well, that honesty to the people I speak to. Okay. Uh, now we're going to pivot a little bit more to, to theological issues. And here's another one, that, uh, another quote from you that came from the uh, Zondervan's Three Views on Creation. Um, in your defense of young earth creationism, you said, Natural science at the moment seems to overwhelmingly point to an old cosmos. Though creationist scientists have suggested some evidences for a recent cosmos, none are widely accepted as true. It is safe to say that most recent creationists are motivated by religious concerns. 
some people might be a little concerned with that, that you would hold a position that you say is almost directly contradicted by science. Is that the well, you're doing? Well, um, look, science isn't the only thing that we bring to the world in terms of our understanding. Uh, I mean, the, the world would be kind of a boring place. I mean, I love mm. science, don't get me wrong, but but we bring theology, we bring philosophy, we, we bring aesthetics, we bring a whole bunch of things to our full, full-blooded, complete understanding of reality. And for me, uh, when I open the Bible, and I'm a Christian, I open the Bible, and it seems to teach, for instance, there that Adam and Eve were a real couple, and that the whole of humanity traces their history to this original pair. Uh, it seems to teach, and, and Jesus, you know, uh, affirmed that in the New Testament. It seems to teach a lot of things that conflict with aspects of science that most science, most historical scientists hold to. Now, I can't escape that tension, but I can't escape it in a whole bunch of different ways. So I have a, a sister-in-law who is in the Navy. She's a pathologist doctor, right? When she teaches her students, she does not tell them, some mornings when you come in here to the morgue, these drawers are going to be open and people, corpses will be gone, right? Dead people stay dead, right? That is a reliable generalization about our experience of dead people. Dead people stay dead. They're in the morgue drawer when you show up in the morning. But my sister-in-law is also a Christian. On Easter morning, the stone was rolled away. Jesus was gone. So in her full understanding of reality, uh, the normal behavior of natural things does not exhaust what is possible. And as a Christian, I want to affirm, and I do affirm, that, that God's authority over the universe that he made, I don't deify nature. I don't give it the, the place of ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is God and his power. And if he wants to raise his son from the dead, <laughs> Easter morning, the body will be gone. So you understand that I think that there's a tension between what I affirm theologically and what I affirm scientifically. And I just have learned to live with the conflict between the two. And as a final note, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says I have to have an answer for every puzzle that I confront. In fact, the Bible actually warns us, don't think that you will. Uh, so I live with the tension. Segwaying a little more into some of the theological issues, some people live with that tension, um, yeah. and then some people can't. And I'm wondering if you would if you would comment what do you what would you say about people that take the route? Well, if the Bible says it, then science must be wrong, and then contrast it with people that say, well, if science says it, then I misunderstood the Bible. Uh, I think both of those are recipes for unhappiness. Um, I think that the, the nature of faith, a, a living faith is something that uh, does not say to God or to science, you have to give me the complete answer. I think the healthy attitude for a Christian who's in the sciences is to have a kind of loving disrespect for science. <laughs> Love it for what it can do, but don't let it dominate you. Maintain your intellectual freedom and recognize that the history of science is littered with failed theories. Every, every theory that we hold right now, even our most basic theories in physics, such as relativity and quantum mechanics, can't be reconciled. Uh, it's part of the project to phys of physics to bring those together, but don't let any scientific theory take the role of an idol that, that, and, and dictate to you the nature of reality. Conversely, for theology, recognize that you may be misinterpreting scripture. Your view of any passage in scripture may have been skewed by something that's actually not true. So part of the process of coming to understand scripture is, is listening to what our experience in, in science tells us. And if there are uncomfortable tensions there, it's important to put those before God and say, I'm not going to hold you hostage to this. I'm not going to demand of an answer from you, but I want to learn. I want to be instructed. It's painful, but that's the that for me has been the best route. From your perspective as a you know as a Discovery Institute um, researcher as well as you know, your personal perspective too, uh, do you think there are any reasons why we should as Christians skew towards um, certain versions of creationism versus others? For example, um, we know that you know you said you're a young Earth creationist. Th but for um, th 
Theologically. Theologically. So in my in my scientific work. Scientifically, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think there are any theological reasons that we should use to uh, um, reject uh, evolution? And specifically, um, when we're talking about you know different types of so evolution, you know, old Earth, you know, this whole spectrum mm-hmm. of creationist views, um, we're not talking about you know capital E evolution. Obviously, right. we're talking about theistic evolution, something like that. Right. For me, evolution as a biological theory is not the real challenge. The real challenge is at a much deeper level, and it has to do with your philosophy of science. So if you look at Darwin's own career, for instance, as a young man returning after the Beagle voyage and setting up housekeeping with his, with his wife in London, if you go into his notebooks, his discovery of natural selection and his views about common descent were way downstream of his materialism. So he decided that he was a materialist first. And it's very clear in the notebooks, long before natural selection pops up as a scientific theory, he's already committed to a materialist understanding of reality. So the philosophical commitment to a certain kind of answer is prior to what theory you accept. So for me, the challenge isn't really evolution. I mean, yes, I'm a skeptic of many aspects of the theory, but far more difficult for me is the philosophy of science that says, whatever the evidence, I have to have this kind of an answer. It's got to be a natural mechanism. In a case like that, it doesn't really matter what the evidence is. God could have put a barcode in the DNA of every living thing, right? Like, God Incorporated, year zero, I did this, pay attention, you know, here's the lottery number for next week, you know. It wouldn't matter because you'd say, well, I have to interpret this in in the light of some kind of natural process. So to, to answer your question, I think for many Christians, the real tension will not be with particular scientific theories, which can be amended and challenged. It has to do at a much deeper level with what are you going to let count as evidence? What are you going to let count as an explanation? And there, I think, is where the, 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 the conflict is really joined. In the trailer for the Origin video, and as well as for um, other organizations uh, that are loosely under the intelligent design um, umbrella, w- those that take an explicit theological position typically say something to the effect of, your origins matter. Um, I know Hank Hanengraf uh, said specifically, this is not an apologetics issue, it's the apologetics issue. Would you take that same tack to say that um, depending on your view of material origins, that can influence everything in your theology? I think it, I think that the Christian worldview, the story that we tell the world about why we're here, uh, the whole concept of sin, for instance, doesn't really make sense unless you have a created universe created by a, a supreme intelligence, a mind that put us here for a reason to whom we are morally accountable so in that respect, I would say yes. I mean, you look, think about the Apostles' Creed, right? Three articles. Uh, you know, I, I learned it in catechism as a Lutheran kid growing up. I believe in God the Father, God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. Genesis opens the narrative. God brought the universe into existence. It's very much harder to make sense of the Christian worldview without that creation narrative without the concept of a fall, in, you know, that we, we're all still struggling and suffering as, on account of that. So I, I would never tell someone, you've got to accept my view of biology to be a Christian. But I would tell them, if you're going to be a Christian, recognize that that worldview makes claims about the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of humankind, the origin of moral, moral categories, that arguably, yeah, they're non-negotiables. Otherwise, the story just comes apart, right? Um, I had an experience once uh, as a kid coming back from my first semester at college. I met with a friend, a very close friend. I acted in school plays with her in high school. She went to Yale. And we were sitting around talking with a bunch of friends, and I was trying to defend my Christian faith. And she listened very politely, and then she said to me, but why do I need to be saved, right? It didn't make any sense to her. The concept of sin from which I had said I was being saved, there was no traction there because her her whole understanding of reality, the concept of sin had no referent, as we say in philosophy. There was nothing out there in the universe or in herself that corresponded to that. 
So maybe it's a long-winded answer. It's, it matters to, to make sense of Christianity that we have some account of creation in which God is ultimately responsible for everything that we see. Does that help? So basically you're saying you're, you're, this is a specific theory, you know, agnostic statement. You're not saying that we have to have a six-day view or that we have to have a young earth or old earth, any particular view, but we have to have a view of, of the universe that you know God is the grounding and the, the creator of everything. Amen. As we wrap up, uh, we have a fun question that we ask a lot of our science-minded uh, science guests, and that is that you're on a ship in the ocean and you have crashed on a deserted island, um, but fortunately you get to bring along your favorite element from the periodic table. So which one is your favorite element and why? Well, the question, there's the, there's the desert island aspect to it that, um, I mean, I'll be honest, if I, if I could pick anything, I'd take gold, right? Mm -hmm. But not on a desert island. <laughs> on a desert island, I would take helium. Oh, really? Lots of it, right? <laughs> and I would find some way to, to I mean, I don't want to stay on that island. You know, I want to get off. So I would find some way to make a, a, some kind of container big enough to put helium in to get me off up in the air and in a nice strong wind current. So, um, I mean, helium is a cool, it's a cool element really, but on a desert, in a desert island condition, gold is going to do me no good at all. <laughs> so give me helium, helium, a steady supply and lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for uh, your time today. Um, the movie is Origin. You can get it from Illustra Media. Any closing remarks? Uh, yeah, keep an open mind, folks. Next to your own soul, the most precious thing you have is your intellectual freedom. Don't give it away to anybody. <laughs>